I speak to you in the name of God, who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. On the first Sunday of this Epiphany season, back at the very beginning of this year, we remembered Jesus' baptism. On that chilly January morning, our imaginations were transported to the banks of the Jordan River. From amidst the reeds and the tall grass, we looked out to see Jesus in the arms of St. John the Baptist. He was immersed in the muddy water. As John lifted Jesus back into the, sh into the sunlight, water sheeting off his bearded face, we stood in awe as the heavens were ripped open and the voice of God rang out. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. In that moment, Jesus received his charge. If Jesus had any lingering doubt about who he was and what God wanted him to do with his life, it was resolved in that moment. Jesus was the beloved son of God, the one whom the prophets had foretold the one who would set right all the wrongs of the world. On this last Sunday of our Epiphany season, some five weeks hence, we remember Jesus' transfiguration. Our imaginations are transported to Mount Tabor. We stand atop a tall peak in the midst of a large valley. We can see for miles in every direction. We have come here with Jesus, with Peter and James and John, because Jesus asked us to step away with him for a moment. It's been a busy few weeks, and Jesus feels that we need to be focused and centered before we head on to what lies ahead. Just as we begin to settle in, just as we begin to relax a little bit, everything changes. The heavens are again torn open. Jesus' face is transfigured before us. His clothes become a dazzling white. And that same voice that we heard at Jesus' baptism rings out once more. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. The scene is entirely familiar, but not familiar quite identical. At Jesus' baptism, the voice from heaven says, you are my son. At the transfiguration, the voice from heaven says, this is my son. God's audience has changed. At the Jordan River, God spoke to Jesus. On Mount Tabor, God speaks to us. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. What follows next are two chapters of teachings about life and faith. Two more chapters will follow after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus' work on earth is largely complete by this point in the story. His flashy miracles are mostly behind us. What remains for Jesus to do is to teach his disciples how to carry on in his absence, how to live the life of faith in a way that will persuade others to do the same. Mark is the shortest of the canonical gospels by some distance. For Mark to devote four chapters to the teachings of Jesus that follow the transfiguration is no small matter. Four chapters is one quarter of the entire book. Four chapters is almost twice as much space as Mark devotes to Jesus' annunciation, nativity, baptism, betrayal, and trial combined. God wants us to listen to Jesus, and Jesus has a lot to say. 
In the chapters that follow, Jesus offers some of his most challenging teaching. Jesus twice condemns his disciples' competition to see which one of them will be regarded as the greatest, and he twice praises the simple faith of children. Jesus says that we have to pay our taxes and insists that we love our neighbor. Jesus condemns divorce and he tells rich people to give all their money away. Many of the teachings that follow the transfiguration are the kind of teachings that we would most like to ignore. They're the ones that stop us dead in our tracks. And yet God shouts down from heaven, listen to this man. Listen to my son. Jesus' teachings are no different in our day than they were in his, and they're no easier to receive. Jesus asks all of his disciples, both ancient and modern, to live lives that are focused and intentional, lives that prize people over property, lives that seek to serve others over self. We can rationalize our way around all of these teachings. We can declare them quaint and impractical. But they remain what they are. And God's instruction remains what it is. Listen to him. Over the next seven weeks, many Christians will take on practices of fasting and self-denial. The goal of these Lenten disciplines is to create a noticeable sense of absence in our lives. We give up something that we will miss so as to remind ourselves of something we too often forget, namely Jesus, our need for his grace and his willingness to offer it. We all have our go-to give-ups, the perennial favorites on our Lenten lists, but I wonder if there might be another way to approach Lent. I wonder if there are Lenten disciplines that would look a little bit less like New Year's resolutions and a little bit more like listening to Jesus. Jesus says some difficult things in Mark. Jesus asks us to give away our money, to keep our egos in check, and to separate ourselves from anything that might cause us to stumble, no matter how precious it is. Jesus offers no exceptions for circumstance and no room to say that we've done enough. Jesus sets a very high standard and a voice from heaven begs us to listen. The story of Jesus' baptism is much less challenging than the story of his transfiguration. We are spectators in chapter 1, but we receive our charge in chapter 9. We have a sweet story to tell as we walk up the banks of the Jordan River, but we have work to do as we walk down the slopes of Mount Tabor. The question before us as we approach Lent is this. Are we willing to accept the challenge of the transfiguration? Are we willing to walk down the mountain and recommit ourselves to the hard work of listening to Jesus with all of the sacrifice that will entail? If we are not willing, we will likely leave Lent in the same condition that we entered it, unchallenged, unchanged. If we are willing, If we are willing to walk down that mountain, God promises that he will transform us in ways that will exceed our imaginations. We will grow like mustard seeds from smallness to greatness. We will draw near to the kingdom of God. In the name of the church, I call you to the observance of a holy Lent. Accept the challenge and be amazed at what happens next.